I welcome you, Father, in this place. I magnify your holy name. I give you glory. I give you praise. I exalt your holy name. I thank you, Lord God, for all that you are and all that you have created us to be. Holy Spirit, I welcome you in this atmosphere. I know that you are here with us. Jesus, I know that you are here, and I thank you for your presence, for your power. You have said that where two or more of us are gathered, you are there in the midst. But even more than that, you are in us. You have made your home in us because we love your holy name. Oh, I pray, Father, that on this Mother's Day, those that have not had mothers, for whatever reason, will find a mother in you, O oh God. Those who have not known what it is to be comforted in the bosom of a godly mother, that those will know what it is to be loved by a mom, by a good mom. And those mothers who know that they have made mistakes and who are struggling even now with their identity as mothers, with their past works, with their failures, with the ruins that their children encounter because of the insufficiency of their parent parenting. That, Lord God, you will give them peace and comfort. They will not be drowned in condemnation, but that they will find hope in you in this hour. Holy Spirit, I ask even now for those who are childless, who desire this role of motherhood, that you would grant them the anointing, not just for conception, but the anointing to be strong women of God who would bring their children up in your admonition and in your love. Oh, I thank you for the role of motherhood. And though we have perverted it in the nations of the world, we have, uh, we have counted ourselves unworthy in this role, in the things that we allow, especially in this particular country. Um, I pray that you will forgive us for every sin, for the abomination of killing our children because they decided to take a ride in our bodies. And that you will open the eyes of every woman to understand and to know that life is a sanctified thing and it is sacred. So help us today be mothers who wake up and champion the cause of all life. Because every life has purpose. Every life has purpose. So let us be those mothers that will champion the cause of every life. Born, unborn, it doesn't matter. A life is a life. Help us to be those mothers today. In your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, Holy Spirit, I ask you to permeate this atmosphere. I ask you to be with every person who will hear. Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Every lying spirit, every mind-binding spirit, I curse in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind you up. I bind up the spirit of condemnation, self-condemnation, because in Christ Jesus there is no condemnation. And everything that we have done, no matter how bad, no matter how horrible, in Christ there is always forgiveness. Always. In Christ there is always forgiveness. The Bible says that the only thing that God will not forgive is the blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. But outside of that, there is no sin that you can commit that is not covered by grace if you ask God for forgiveness. So whatever it is that you may have possibly done to your children, to others, in God there is the remission of sins. And with God, it goes into the sea of forgetfulness. And so self-condemnation is not 
going to serve your needs at all. Um, there is forgiveness in Christ for whatever it is. And to those mothers who are blinded by the enemy of their soul, the God of this world, open, give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to be able to receive everything that you have. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask you to help our world. We need your light more than ever. We need your glory. We need the demonstration of your power in the midst of us, in this country, in the nations of the world. We need to see God. We are that light in a dark place. We are that salt where there is no flavor. And so, Holy Spirit, let us see this outpouring of you, of your power, of your glory, so that men may know that God is, and God still is, and God will always be, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome and happy Mother's Day. I am Apostle Mary Gibbs, and as always, it is a pleasure to be with you today. So just uh, saying happy Mother's Day to all moms, all moms who um, are moms, all moms who wish to be moms, happy Mother's Day. And I come in agreement with you that God will grant you conception so that you can experience the joy of motherhood. Come on. We bless our Father. We bless God. Sure, parenting is not the easiest job on earth. It is the most important job on earth <laughs> right but and it is not the easiest and truth be told it doesn't actually come with an instruction manual and so the only way that you can know what to do as a parent is that you would have to sit at the foot of Christ to learn what um, the specific needs of your children are right there is no, no matter how many children you have, there is no one size fits all because every single individual that comes to the earth comes as a unique entity. It is different from every other creature that exists in the face of the earth. And no two people have the same exact purpose. Every life is sent here for a reason. And so, as parents, our first priority is to ensure that we understand what that role means to God, what God expects from us when we occupy that role. Come on. When we occupy that role. Family was created as a design of God's um, personality, right? God himself is a family. And so everything that human beings are was copied from the image of God, right? And so for us to understand how parenting and relationships and all of these things work, we must look at how God, how they work in God. And when we understand how they work in God, then we understand how they work here in the earth realm. Well, today uh, the title of my message is Image of a Godly Mother. Image of a Godly Mother. All right, well, come to, with me. We're reading from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And I'm reading from the New King James Bible. And uh, New King James Version, and the Bible says... On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, Honey, they have no wine. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and verse 4, look at Jesus' reply. Jesus says, to her woman what does your concern have to do with me my hour has not yet come right 
He's like, why do you think that I should be concerned with what you're concerned about? I mean, what in the world? What are you talking about? They have nobody. Why is this my business? <laughs> okay. Verse 5. And so his mother says to the servant, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning of the feast, oh, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Verse 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Come on. Come on. The image of a godly mother. Okay, so now we know moms, well women, first of all, normally are fussy, right? But moms more so, right? And so I know that a lot of us can relate with Mama Mary here, <laughs> right? She's at a party that she was invited to probably, maybe she's a guest of honor, who knows, right? But whatever the case, when she saw that there was no wine, to her, that was an issue, right? And so, and right, so to her, that's a concern. And so she goes to Jesus, who was also invited, and she says to him, hey, honey, um, they have no wine. And he looks at her and he says, what? I mean, excuse me? Come again? They have no wine. What, what has that got to do with me? <laughs> right? What has your concern about their wine got to do with me? Hmm. Hear what he says. He says, my hour has not yet come. But the Bible records that Mary didn't say anything else to him. She went about her way. <laughs> and when she left, she went straight to the servants and she says, Hey, listen, whatever that man over there tells you to do, do it. Why? Because Mary had faith. Mary was a woman of purpose who recognized that she had given birth to a child of purpose. And everything that Mary did was not of selfish reasons. She understood the potential of her son because at this time, her son had not yet manifested his glory. Come on, Kobosha. Right? He had not yet manifested his glory. And she understood that this was the son of God, Kebosha, right? She knew that he got in her womb through the Holy Spirit. And that everything that this man was going to do was going to change the world. She knew that this was God. And she knew that miracles were a part of his identity. Because he says to her, woman, why are you bothering me? My hour has not yet come. It is not yet time for me to manifest my glory. But look at the power of a godly mother. A godly mother sees beyond the limitations of time. 
And when she placed a demand on the anointing on his life, she didn't even tell him anything anymore. She didn't have to reply to him and say, oh, you're the son of God. You know you can do it, son. She's like, okay. And straight away, she goes to the, the servants and she says, whatever he tells you to do, come on, do it. And because his mother was a godly woman, he manifested his glory before the appointed time. Come on. Hey, Yeramasia. Come on. Where are the godly mothers? The mothers who are not concerned with self, um, uh, self needs and selfishness and me, 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 all about me. Narcissistic mothers. No. Right? Because most well, not most, but again, like I said, I'm just assuming maybe she was the one of the guest of honor or something. I don't know. Because he says, you are concerned that there is no wine. What? Why is that my business? I mean, what? Really? <laughs> right? So she had to be somebody of importance at this wedding for her to be concerned, for her to be, uh, be care that wine was done. There was no wine. But she didn't panic. She said, oh, my son is here. She says, God is here. And so because of the demand that Mary placed on the anointing of, on Christ's life, he manifests his glory before the time. You see, this is what godly mothers do. A godly mother will look at their children and everything that they do is to, is to come in agreement with the purpose of God in the life of that child. Whatever God has told you about your children, a godly mother ensures that she does everything in her power to facilitate it. The role of motherhood, the role of parenting, but motherhood, I think, particularly, is of great importance. Because motherhood, mothers are the vessel that God chose as the bridge between the supernatural and the natural. The miracle that connects heaven to earth occurs in the womb of a woman. And God chose women to be that bridge. God trusted women enough to say, listen, I'm sending precious cargo and I need you to take care of it. I need you to ensure that it crosses over from the kingdom of heaven into the kingdom of men. Come on. So you see why destroying a child in the womb when it's not medically or morally indicated is abominable. Because somebody with purpose was on their way to the earth. And that life was savagely taken when we performed these abominable acts. God entrusted mothers to be the ones to bridge the gap between heaven and earth. So that when God sends a spirit from the heavens, the pathway they must take is the body of a woman. Come on. And that body, once they get there, that body begins to ensure that they are fully formed into a human being. That body nourishes it. That body cares for it. It is a sacrifice. Yeah, motherhood is a sacrifice. Because you get ill sometimes from the, the, the conception. There is pain during your delivery. You have to give up things. You have to sacrifice things. 
right? There's certain things you can't eat anymore. <laughs> There's certain things you can't consume, certain things you can't put in your body. Your body physically changes. You have aches and pains, headaches. I mean, your hormones. Not to mention that your body <laughs> changes for the worse <laughs> most of the time. Right? And so motherhood requires sacrifice. You cannot be selfish if you are going to be a mother. You can't. And the role of motherhood, God rewards when you do the right things. And then so you say, well, Apostle, you don't know I have a hillion of, for kids. Okay. Okay. Okay, so yeah, maybe your children, you didn't raise them up a particular way, or even maybe you did. And it just still didn't work out the way that you thought it would. But when we look at what a godly mother looks like, a godly mother is not a person that does not have challenges with her children. A godly mother is not a person that is not going to know sorrow because of her children. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 2, when Mary uh, came to uh, dedicate Jesus in the temple, there was a, 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 a prophet there, Simon, or Simeon, who was waiting to see Christ because God had promised him that he would see Christ. And while, when he saw him, he rejoiced. But then he says to Mary, he says, surely a sword is going to pierce your soul because of this child that you have. In other words, you are going to cry. You are going to grieve. You are going to mourn because of this boy. And it has to be this way because without it, he cannot fulfill his purpose. Come on. When God sends a movement into the earth through you and you are the parent, it does not mean that everything is going to be hunky-dory. There will be challenges. And even though this was told Mary, did Mary truly understand that this meant that her son, when he turned 33, was going to be nailed to a cross and killed right in front of her? That he would be ridiculed and mocked and spat on? That her friends would laugh at her and say, oh, look at your son. He's calling himself the son of God. What is wrong with him? Can you imagine watching your own child being sacrificed on a cross somewhere? And this is why the prophet says to her, he says, woman, a sword is going to pierce your soul. This is what God has intended, that, that you give birth to a son that is meant to be killed and taken from you. He will not bury you, you will bury him. So knowing all of that and still giving her love, her sacrifice, giving her all to this child. A godly woman, a godly mother is all about the purpose of their children. A godly mother comes in agreement with God for the purpose of their children. That's what a godly mother does. So if you are going to find fulfillment in your role as a mother, regardless of whatever your child may be doing, <laughs> you see God's face on what is the purpose for my child. Show me how to come in alignment with it, in agreement with it. Mary didn't control... Um, Mary didn't control Jesus. She wasn't trying to control him. She was saying to him, listen, you are the son of God. This is not beyond your power, your ability. I know that you can manifest glory. And so because a mother believed in her son that much, 
He manifested miracles. He manifested his glory before his time. Because he says to her, my hour has not yet come. But she didn't, she wasn't moved by that. She said, okay, I mean, <laughs> do whatever he tells you to do. Right? And so, when we are mothers of, of, when we are godly mothers, and we assume the role of a godly mother, it's not an easy feat. Because part of that struggle is that God is requiring, requiring you to give that child back to him. Hmm. And that's what a godly mother does. A godly mother relinquishes her control of her children over to God. Let God admonish them, let God discipline them once they've reached a particular age, right? Let God deal with them. I said in my own life, there are times that God will speak to me and say, Mary, you need to step back from your child, really. Because I'm so concerned, oh, she'll break her arm, she'll do this, she'll, she's like, just step back, would you? Thank you. <laughs> No matter how much we love our children, we cannot protect them from their purpose. So sorry to tell you that. So whatever your child's purpose is, what you can do to, cut, to, to, to see that it comes into fruition is agree with God. That's it. That's the only thing you can really do that will be of value. Because if you try to force them into their purpose, there will be rebellion. You agree with God and you listen to God's instruction for how to bring them up. And when they go astray, you continue to pray their purpose as God has revealed it to you and it will happen. <laughs> right? The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go and even though he departs from it, at some day he will return. We saw the prodigal son in Luke 15. He knew he was the son of a king. And though he departed from his, from his, uh, uh, his, uh, his heritage, at the right season of his life, he came back. I mean, what else are you going to do? So yes, you may have children who are now grown, who were brought up in church, and you thought you did a great job, and now they're talking about <laughs> crazy things, and... They're talking about there is no God, what God, it's, I mean, and you're like, what? Where is this coming from? You know, they have, they don't want to have anything to do with God, but you know that they are a movement. You know that God called them for such a time as this. You know that even when they, uh, when they were in your womb, that God spoke to you about them. Come on, Yehosha. So... You don't fight them, you don't, you know, especially if they're teenagers or not, right? Because teenagers are, are teenagers know everything, so what are you going to tell them? And so do young adults. <laughs> and so when a, a child is in that age group, I mean, you come in agreement with God, what God has said. We know that we don't want our children doing all kinds of crazy things, right? But yet, they get to a place where they will because they are now trying to find themselves, right? And as they try to find themselves, they're going to rebel against everything that is you. Because they don't want to, you to define them. They are looking for self-discovery. Self-discovery is the right of every human being. No matter how young or old. Every one of us has the right to self-discover. What does that mean? That means that there will probably come a time where your child begins to speak stuff that you are like, you are crazy. I did not raise you up this way. <laughs> Self-discovery. What you can do is come in agreement with God's purpose. Ask God, how do I pray? But if God has already revealed this purpose, you begin to declare that purpose over their lives. They will return at the appointed season, just as the prodigal son returned. Come on, Shah, come on. They will return. 
But I know it's hard because your heart strings are tied to this baby, right? And no matter how old they are, they will always still be a baby. My daughter is going to be six in a few weeks. But when I say to her, oh, thank you, babe, she's like, I'm not a baby. And I'm not saying she's a baby. I'm saying as a, as a word of endearment, right? And she's like, I'm a big kid, right? Not even six. So I can imagine as time goes on how this conversation is going to continue to play out. And so our heartstrings are tied to our children because we don't want them to make mistakes. We don't want them to break bones. My sister, my sister, my daughter is um, uh, what you might call it. She's a, she's a, she's a natural athlete. She's a natural gymnast, right? So it's like her body is, is, is extremely flexible. And so, so sometimes she'll do these flips and somersaults and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, because <laughs> I mean, I'm like, she can break her head. But this is part of her purpose. This is part of her makeup. Okay, so if along the way she breaks bones, oh well, <laughs> that's part of it. Right? And so there are times God has said to me, Mary, hey, 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 back up, okay? Just back on up. Thank you, ma'am. Right? <laughs> right? Don't be this helicopter mom. Let, let, right? I mean, you keep your kids safe, but you get what I'm saying. There comes a time when we have to let the kids go. There comes a time when we have to cut the cord. Come on. You know, when a woman first gives birth, um, medically, the umbilical cord, the thing that attaches the mom to the baby and, and supplies all the nutrients and all of that for the baby, it has to be cut. Once the child has come out into the earth, that thing cannot stay there, right? Because the longer that cord stays there, it begins to impair that child physically. That child begins to suffer impairments, right? And their development now becomes endangered. Why? Because the umbilical cord that once provided life to this child is no longer needed. This child has now phased out into a different place in the existence of their life. And so, as a mother, you cannot hover over your children continuously throughout their life. That's just not healthy, and they will not develop normally. Right? And when you have a child of purpose, God is not going to let you do that. Right? Godly mothers have to be women of faith. No matter what hits my child's life, I am going to pray. I am going to continue to believe. Let's go to Luke 2, verses 41 to 52. Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look. Your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. But then he goes back with them and he's subject to them. K. 
Can you imagine losing your child for four days? I mean, I can't imagine it. This woman, this Mary, she had to be a woman of such great faith. I cannot imagine losing my child for four whole days, not knowing where my child is. Is my child safe? Did, did she eat or sleep or what, what's going on? I mean, can you imagine losing, not knowing the whereabouts of your child, your young children for four days or any child at all, right? Not knowing for a certainty that your child is safe. But this woman, and she told Jesus, she says, listen, why did you do this? This is not okay. She said, we were scared. We were anxious for you. We searched you for four days. And Jesus is 12 and he's like, okay, why would you be looking for me? Don't you know where I would be? I mean, don't you understand what I am? Why, why in the world would you be looking for me? Don't you get that I must be about my father's business? <laughs> he was not even remorseful. He didn't even say, oh, I'm sorry. It's like, what are you talking about? I have something that I need to do for God. Right? And so sometimes when, you, when your children have begun to tap into purpose, some of the stuff they do will appear extremely rude. Right? <laughs> and again, it's not that they are purposefully being rude. It's that self-discovery they are f trying to find self they are trying to find who in the world am i and you are disturbing my purpose or or, or, or my my process of self-discovery by trying to sit on my head <laughs> right and so there's this conflict that ensues because they see you as the enemy that won't let them be and you see them as this wayward child that has no respect and is ungrateful. But that is not the case. They are finding the struggle is the struggle to find self. Who am I? And they need to come to that revelation on their own, mama, without you. Sure, you can guide them. Hey, this is what God said to me about you when you were born or before you came or whatever. You can confirm what they are believing. They come home and say, oh, I think I'm this, I think of that, and that it contradicts what God has said about their life. It's a simple, hey, honey, no. this is what God said to me that you were. And God doesn't lie. I know this is what you are because this is what God said. I, you know, not what I want you to be. This is what your creator sent you here for. But Jesus already knew who he was. He says to his mama, he says, hey, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? I mean, what are you talking about? Because even I thought about it. I'm like, where in the world did this 12-year-old sleep for four days? <laughs> what did he eat for four days? But I know that God is with him, and God was with him, and he was provided for. Whatever the case, he was taken care of. Sometimes I see all these um, Amber Alerts, you know, missing kids, kidnapped kids, and my heart just breaks because I say, oh God, I can't, I can't imagine this, and I have to pray for those children even though I don't know them because I'm like, I cannot imagine a parent not knowing where their child is. One minute you're standing and the next minute your child has disappeared right in front of your eyes. I can't. That has got to be the most horrific experience other than watching your child killed, right? That has got to be the most horrific experience. Not knowing where your young child is, not knowing where your children are. Even when they're in college or they're off at work or they're deployed somewhere. At the back of your mind, you're like, oh my gosh. You know, or you have children that are in law enforcement or, or something like that and you're like, oh my gosh, what is happening with my child today? Our children need us to be godly mothers. They need us to care about their purpose. 
They need us to believe in them. Oh, Yabaha, as Mary believed in her son. This woman made a lot of sacrifices for Jesus Christ. But when God picked her, he picked a woman that was godly. Because when the angel Gabriel came to her in Luke 1, when he greeted her, he says, Oh, woman, greatly favored by God. He says, Thou art full of grace and highly favored. And she said, What kind of greeting is this? And that is the image that God desires to see in every mother. A woman that is full of grace and highly favored. And even if your children don't appreciate or show you gratitude, according to Proverbs 31, there will come a day where they will rise up and call you blessed. Maybe right now they don't understand. But the day is going to come where they will rise up and call you blessed. And God will reward you surely for being that godly woman. Being that godly mother. And the proposition that God gave this woman was a hard one in their time. Because what God said to her is, I need you to allow yourself to become impregnated out of wedlock. Come on. And back then, pregnancy out of wedlock carried with it a sentence of stoning. Come on. Kibosha. And so here she was. She said, oh, okay. So let me get this right. I am going to know the pain of childbirth without enjoying the pleasure of becoming pregnant. Come on, right? Because sure, before you can get pregnant, you must have some kind of pleasure, right? And so this woman is not even going to know the pleasure of conception. She will go straight from being a virgin to being a mama who has to experience labor pains having never known the intimacy of a man having never known the the pleasure the pleasure of intercourse having never known that right because the pleasure of that is what kind of causes you not to pay attention that you're getting pregnant right because <laughs> you're busy enjoying the pleasure of it but she didn't have that. She had some experience that was completely different. But I can't imagine that when the Holy Ghost came upon her, she was filled with she was filled with something that none of us would probably or could have probably described. And I would imagine that it would be the same kind of feeling when the Holy Ghost comes over you and you know this warm blanket of, of peace and and oh tranquil peace you know that you were touched by God so maybe she didn't have the pleasure of a man but she had the pleasure of the living God come on and that is a million times better than anything any human being can give you anyway so but for starters her flesh didn't know that secondly she would give birth <laughs> she would know pain thirdly she would know the shame of becoming impreg impregnated, <laughs> a thing that has never been done before. So there was a shame that she had to carry, I'm sure, for most of her life because those that knew probably not all believed that this was the child of God. It had never been done before. God had never given conception to a woman in this way. She was an apostle of her time, a pioneer. God had never done this in the life of any human before this. So can you imagine her saying, oh, the child inside me, God put it there. And people are like, girl, you better get out of here before we stone you. Nobody would have believed that. I don't even think even her own mother would have believed that. It's just not heard of. And so she had to endure the pain of, of her reputation being marred because she got pregnant. Oh, Yerebo Shunda. What sacrifices are you willing to make for your children? 
And when you make those sacrifices, you don't make them for the kids and say, oh, by the way, look at what I did for you, right? No. You make them because you are coming in agreement with the purposes of God. Come on. And so it is God who will reward you. Mary stayed with this boy till the end. When Jesus was on the cross, being crucified, in the book of John, and um, Jesus was there looking at her and John, in John 19, verses 25 through 27, I think, is it? Yeah. She followed this man throughout his life, and she loved him. To know that, in the end, I have to give him up. Come on, I cannot imagine that. To know that in the end, we are just stewards. We are just stewards. We are just the vessels through whom God wants to use to build up a, 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 a purpose-filled individual. We are simply stewards. We don't own these children. God owns them and, 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 and he gives them over to us as stewards to keep them for him until he's ready to use them. And that's what Mary was to this man, Jesus. Because she's the only one who is at the foot of the cross with John looking at him. I cannot imagine watching my child being killed. I just cannot imagine that. I can't imagine any mother that can watch that. I can't. But she even in her pain, stood at the cross and watched this man. She loved him with her entire being. Oh, my Sarabaka. She loved him with her entire being. There was not one selfish bone in her body. Because she looked at her son, she watched as the world killed him. She still blessed God. And through all of it, she was with him. She never denied him once. She never said, son, please don't do this. She understood for this reason. You came into my life and now it's time for me to let you go. And I can imagine that for all of us, this we would feel the same kind of pain, even though our children are not being murdered. We will feel the same kind of pain when it's time to cut the cord and let the baby go. And Jesus says, listen, mother, he's telling his mother, behold your son. And he tells the Apostle John, he says, hey, son, behold your mother. I need you to look after my mother because my time here with you all is done. Come on. And he loved his mother because in the midst of all his pain, come on, Ibusha. In the midst of all his pain, he thought about his mother and how she would miss him. And even though she had other sons, other children, he still said, this John is replacing me. Oh, God will reward everything that you do as a mother. Every sacrifice that you make, God sees it and he will reward you. You don't have to look to your children to pay you back. God will pay you back for good that you have done, so you don't have to mistreat your children because they're not behaving as they ought to right now. Your rewarder is God because the role of motherhood, God gave it to you, not your child. He's your boss, not your child. So it is he that will reward you, not your child. It's like a business owner who, who hires a manager. The business owner is the boss of the manager, not the employee that is being managed. 
Your child is the employee that you are managing. But your boss is the God who gave you the job of motherhood. And it is your God that will reward you, not your children. Your God will do that. But it is a plus when your children rise up and call you blessed. And I promise you that as parents, what you sow is what you will reap. I promise you. If you sow into your child's life, they will reward you richly. If you sow good. But if you sow wickedness and selfishness, guess what you're going to get? Zero. Nothing. One of my siblings once said, my brother actually, he said, you know, a mother is not a person who, 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 um, well, not that he coined it. I'm just saying we were having a conversation once or, you know, and, and he said this in, in passing. He says, you know, when I think of a mother, he says, a mother is not a person who just gives a birth to a child. A mother is the one that makes the sacrifice. And that is the truth. The one who gives birth is the surrogate. That is the vessel through which the child came into the earth. That's not a mother. A mother is the one who laid down her life for the child. That's a mother. Come on. So your mother does not have to be the one that gave birth to you biologically. Your mother is the one that has poured sweat over your life. Has prayed for you. Has fasted on your behalf, has cried on your behalf, has has gone to the horn of the altar and screamed and begged the Lord for your for, for salvation for you, for mercy, for safety. That's a mother. That's a mother. And those are the kind of mothers that God is looking for today. I'm not talking about you becoming a doorman for your children's rubbish. Definitely, definitely not talking about that and not condoning that. Your children should respect you at all cost. And if they don't, you reprimand them. But if they're of age, if they're young adults, you give them to God. So I definitely am not condoning children mis, mis, uh, mis, uh, mistreating their parents or, or, or disrespecting them. No, I'm not with that at all. Don't agree with that. And you should correct them. But what I am saying is that the role of motherhood is a role in which you answer to God, not your children. And so as a result, the, the, the reward comes from God and not your children. At the close of Mary's life, we see that, well, not at the close of her life, but after Jesus has resurrected and has ascended to heaven, in Acts chapter 1, when the disciples gathered in the upper room, Mary was there too, the mother. She was praying. She believed in her son through and through. And not just believing because she's a mother. She believed what God said. She believed what God said. And that is what a godly mother does. You believe what God says to the very end. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for these mothers, these godly mothers that you have created in the earth today. And I pray that mothers all over the world, especially in America, will understand the importance, the relevance of their role as mothers. That they will see this role as one of great importance, one that is ordained by God and respect the role and they will respect the seed that you allow to enter into their bodies forgive us for this wicked crime that we commit in this country killing our unborn because we can what an abomination what an abomination and so forgive us for that and open our eyes so that we can see the truth and the truth can set us free. That a life is a life, no matter what stage it is in, it's still a life. For those mothers who have failed miserably, 
I ask you, Father, that they will feel no condemnation in the name of Jesus. Help them to repent. Ask God to forgive you for every ill thing you've done to your children, for the wickedness that you've done in their lives, for your failures as a mother, a fail your failures as a person. God will forgive you. It doesn't matter for the abuse that you did committed against your children. And that, Father, you will give them the courage to ask for forgiveness from their children so that there can be reconciliation. I bind up the spirit of pride. I bind up that mighty spirit that will try to control you and make you believe that you have done nothing wrong. The devil is a liar, and the Lord rebuke it in Jesus' name. Selfishness cannot be found in the life of a mother. It just cannot. And I come in agreement with you for the faith and the courage to turn a new leaf today, to repent. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, perhaps you don't know this Jesus Christ today. It's really easy to get to know God. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 tells us that uh, God has made it very simple for us to come into relationship with Him. It says that in order to come into relationship with God, all you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And that when his blood was spilled, that it made payment for every sin that you've committed and every sin that you will ever commit. It, 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 it wipes out your sin and it grants you righteousness through a thing called grace. The Bible also says that you must believe that after Jesus died, he rose up by God. He was resurrected by God on the third day and he ascended to heaven. And that now he is in heaven, alive. He's sitting at the throne of God and he is making intercession for you. The Bible says that you must believe this. And when you do, that if you confess it, if you agree with what God has spoken, if you believe in what God has said, and you confess it with your mouth, that you are saved. That's all it takes to become saved. So, you can repeat after me. You can repeat after me, or you can say in your own words. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. I ask you to forgive me for every sin. Come into my life and be the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you pray that prayer, I want to be the first to welcome you into the kingdom of heaven. Father, bring these into a Bible-believing church where they may grow up in your admonition. In Jesus' name. Well, again, happy Mother's Day. Take your mothers out. Be nice to your mothers. And remember, those of you that have failed, God is with you. God has wiped the slate clean, and you can have a fresh start today. As always, it was a pleasure. And so I look forward to seeing you same, ta same time next week. Until then, be blessed, and may the peace of God be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen.